Today's video is gonna be just a little bit different than the normal tutorial video. Through comments, I've received some questions and also numerous emails just asking about multi-factor authentication, some of the pros and cons, why some sites don't use it, and just some generic questions. So I just wanted to take a video and actually just explain multi-factor authentication. You might hear it referred to as SFA for single factor authentication, or 2FA for two-factor authentication, or even 3FA for three-factor authentication. Before we dig in though, I just wanna give a big thank you out to all my subscribers and uh, just anybody that checks out my videos. I kinda had a large gap over the past few months and due to this not being my full-time job, and my full-time job is actually being a teacher in school, and I also coach some sports and do a few other things, my schedule can be very up and down. So the past couple months towards the second half of our winter, my schedule tends to get pretty crazy between the end of the pet band season and also coaching volleyball. And then you throw in a little bit of illness where I had some Darth Vader voice going. It just makes it really challenging to keep up a regular schedule. And I don't want to be one of those that, that, you know, creates videos and just kind of puts them in the dock so they release so that you have one releasing every week. These are, videos I record are to help everybody out. So honestly, as soon as I get them recorded and all the editing done, I really just want to get them out there so that they can help people in whatever thing I'm trying to show in that actual video. So sometimes you might find there's going to be a chunk of time where there's no videos, but generally I'm going to try to get one to three videos out a week. But sometimes, you know, with work duties coming up, it just, that, that does take precedent but I'll definitely keep videos as routine as I possibly can. So I really do appreciate all my viewers and subscribers. Let's jump into multi-factor authentication. So what is multi-factor authentication? Authentication is exactly that, just authenticating who you are. And typically in the past, it's just logging into a website. You have a username and you have a password to log in. That would be called SFA or single factor authentication, where you just have one factor of authentication, meaning your password. When you're dealing with types of authentication, there's a really simple way to kind of break it down. It can be either what you know, what you have, what you are, or where you are. Those are kind of the standard four ways to authenticate. So in regards to single factor authentication, usually it's what you know, a password. Now on your phones, they also have where you can use biometrics like your face ID or your, you know, your fingerprint sensor and some laptops also have that capability and Windows laptops have that, uh, I think it's Windows Hello, uh, where you can log in, it'll, it'll, where it'll scan your face. But generally there's always a fallback to a password. Those are, I wouldn't actually rate them as two-factor authentication. It's just another quick way to log in. It's still using one point of authentication to log in, except it has a fail safe. So if that fingerprint sensor doesn't work, you can always fall back on your passcode or your password. So as I mentioned, single factor authentication is also the least secure, especially if you pick a really bad commonly used password. Uh, one of the favorites I always hear is monkey123 or password123. Or you might do your middle name with maybe your birth year thrown in. Definitely not a good way to do a password. Makes it very, very easily hackable. So you always want to make sure you set a good password. And this video kind of loops into that whole piece of having a password manager that allows you to create these really complex passwords. And the password manager takes care of remembering all of those passwords for you. Because there's no way on earth that you're going to be able to remember a complex password. You might be able to make a trick to remember one of them, but the chances you're going to be able to remember a lot of them are, you know, next to nil. So that's why it's strongly encouraged to actually use a password manager. So now we're also going to get into what's called 2FA or two-factor authentication. In those cases, what it's going to do generally is it's going to use what you know, which is a password, and what you have, which either can be a phone call to your actual phone it can be an SMS text message. It can be an email that is sent to an email address of yours. It can be using a specific app that's on your phone that you have to open up and say, yep, that's me. Or you have to select, a, you know, sometimes the site will say, 
okay, open up this app and click on 59. It'll generate a random number that you have to open the app and actually click on that number. Or you can use an app that's doing OTP or T-O-P-T. So OTP stands for a one-time password. And then T-O-P-T is a time-based one-time password. So time-based one-time password uses an app like Authy that I've discussed in previous videos or Google Authenticator. Um, Microsoft has an authenticator. There's a bunch of them out there. The one I prefer is Authy, but just find one that works best for you. And, and you can go with that if you do this, but those will generate a random six digit passcode that renews or refreshes every 30 seconds. So you have to enter it in within that time period. And if you don't, you got to sit and wait for the next pass passcode to be generated that you can enter in. And the last piece of the what you have is you can also have something like a YubiKey, which is a physical security key that you actually have to plug in and push a button on it for the computer to recognize it and the login to recognize it. That's going really, really hardcore, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, to break down some of these second factors, obviously you want to set a good password. You know, that's been covered over and over, and that's just a theme you're always going to hear me say. But I do want to mention in specific some questions I've had about this second factor in regards to a phone call, a text message, or an email. These are the least secure of the three of what you can have. The phone call, a lot of times banks will do this where they'll call your phone and give you like this robotic six-digit passcode or eight-digit passcode that you have to enter in in order to get into your bank website. And then I'm also going to mention an SMS text message where instead of calling you, they'll text you an actual code that you have to put in. This is one of the more common ones that a lot of different sites use. And sadly, they can be very hackable. Now, for 99% of people, is this going to be a problem? No. If you're someone of importance or have somebody that you know is against you, maybe an ex-spouse that has some capability with technology and knows how to do some things, but it is very easy to call up your cell phone provider and do something called social hacking where they can actually get it where they will be sent a SIM card for your phone and they can put it in and therefore have access to your phone number. So when one of those codes are sent to you, so they'll actually receive that code. It's not a very common one, but it isn't that hard to do. You can find plenty of Google searches where you find that reporters have actually gone through this and have even had it done to them. So I really, I really don't suggest doing that unless you have absolutely no choice. The next one that's a little bit more on that unsecure side is using email. Again, email can be hacked very easily. Now, on your email, you can set up all sorts of multi-factor authentications so that it's a lot more challenging to get into your email, which then does lock it down quite a bit more and makes this one a little bit better option if you're using all these additional resources. Email can still be kind of hackable, so you just, you just want to be careful. As long as you're taking all the precautions out there, you're going to be fine. Now, the best ways to use two-factor authentication is using an app on your phone, the, the time-based one-time password, or a hardware key. Those are the three best methods for really securing your accounts. Now, the one I can think of the most commonly that's the easy to do is Google. They, a lot of times when you're logging into an account, if you have the Gmail app on your phone or one of the Google, one of the core Google apps, when you're logging on a new device, It'll actually say, hey, open up the Gmail app on your phone, and it's going to pop up with a little notification say, hey, are you trying to log in on you know, device X? And you can put, yes, that's me, and it'll let you right in. There are a few companies that do offer that through their own services. So that's a really good, nice, secure way to be able to log in. My personal favorite is a time-based, one-time password using apps, again, like Authy, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, and the few others that are out there where you have to go through a little bit of a setup process for it. Again, you can check out my other video on setting up an app like that using Authy, but all of them pretty much work exactly the same. So it doesn't matter which app you actually use. They're, the process of setting up a time-based one-time password is all the same. And honestly, it's really not that difficult it can be a little intimidating at first, 
But once you do that one or two accounts, you'll find it's very quick and simple to set up those time-based one-time password accounts. Very, very easy to do. The final one is actually having a hardware key. One of the more well-known ones is what's called a YubiKey, Y-U-B-I-K-E-Y. And this is a physical little key. It looks like a little mini USB key that you can plug into your computer. Some of them have NFC capability where you can hold it near your phone and push a little button or you plug it into your laptop. They've got keys like combination keys with USB-A, USB-C. Some have the NFC. There's also uh, Some are lightning capable. All sorts of different combinations. You can just kind of order the one that fits best for you. The one thing I can highly recommend is if you do go this route, purchase two so that you have one that's on you. I actually have one on my keychain, and then you have another one that you keep in another safe location. So if that first one gets lost, you can go find that second one and still log into your accounts. Many of my accounts, I actually have the USB key set up, and then as a fail safe, I can use that time-based one-time password just because sometimes I don't always have that key on me and that time-based one-time password works just fine. So to kind of sum up all the two-factor authentication pieces, you can have the phone call and the SMS text message. Again, some places give you absolutely no choice and that's what you have to use. In those cases, it's better than nothing. And again, for 99% of people, you really don't need to worry about having somebody social engineer and gain access to your phone number and be able to receive your calls and text messages. If you're someone of importance or, you know, a politician or a reporter, things like that, you're definitely going to want to make sure you're not doing those things and you kind of go that step up to that next level. And if you're in those positions, contact your bank and see if there's some additional security that you can put in place in order to protect yourself much better. In this day and age, though, I would say about 99% of websites will allow you to use an app-based login, a time-based one-time password, or a hardware key, or any combination of those three things. And that's what I would do, at least for your big stuff. Obviously, if you're logging into like your local newspaper website where you don't subscribe to it or anything, it's just a generic login or some sort of discussion forum you're on, you know, sometimes on those sites, I've got a generic password I'll just use quickly. Maybe down the road, I'll actually change it, but there's nothing of high importance attached to it, so I don't worry about it. The other thing I do is an extra security measure, and this is a little, it's not a hard thing to do, but it's kind of a nice thing, is I've got a lot of domains because I do a lot of website design and web hosting, so I've actually purchased a special domain name that is not out there at all. I don't use it to sign up for any services. It's a hidden email account. And I created this really funky account. So in my recovery email, a lot of sites will ask to put in a recovery email address. I'll actually put this specific email address in because nobody knows it. There is no way you'll know that account. I don't receive email to it. I don't send email from it. It is only to receive these backups if I need to go to that level. And then finally, we've got that third factor which is biometrics like your fingerprint or face ID or retinal scans, things like that. It's, it's biometrics. It's your part of your body, who you are. That's that third factor. And then the fourth factor a lot of times can be where you're based. You can actually on some services set up where you only can log in from certain locations or certain IP addresses, things like that, that really locks down that security and gives you that extra level. Some of our, you know, some of the services I, I use to administrate our school network, I've got it locked down where it can only be logged in from specific IP addresses. If you're not on that IP address, there is no way you're getting into that service. So again, that's just that final way to just kind of tighten the screws down so that really makes it difficult for somebody to, to break into that account or service or whatever you're trying to protect. 3FA or three-factor authentication is one that I haven't really seen it come up anywhere yet unless it's like really high-end security type stuff. But I think in a matter of time, you'll start seeing that option appear where you can, like maybe to log in on your laptop, you have to put in your password and then you have to use a security key and then you could set it up where you have to use a time, time-based time password. You know, some multiple ways that you just log in on your device or email account. I'd love to see those things set up for bank accounts now, the one question I do receive all the time is, 
why don't most banks use these two-factor authentications? Why do they still rely on that phone call or SMS text message? Now, I don't work for a bank. I don't really have any inside contact. So if you're an employee of a bank and kind of have some inside information on why this is the case, please, please don't hesitate to leave a comment below because I would love to know. My speculation is it comes down to two things. One, it costs money. It can be expensive to put these systems in place and make sure they are really, really secure and work well. The second piece is supporting it. You need people to support those systems because there's more complexity to it means there could be more problems that your customers have and maybe forgetting the login for, you know, they, they lose access to their app. They don't quite get how it works. Um, maybe if they're using a USB security key, they lose that key. So they need to call up the company to have things reset. Then you have to go through all this process. They're trying to make sure someone's not trying to access your accounts that shouldn't be. So there's a lot of support that also has to be there that again, costs money. If you happen to work for a bank that hasn't put this in place and you know the reason why I would love to know, it is just my speculation that it really just comes down to money and time. I know some banks are starting to bring these features into their systems. I think I've heard Bank of America, for example, does allow for a hardware security key like those UB keys. And I think you can even use uh, time-based one-time passwords like Authy or Google Authenticator. To kind of wrap all this up, multi-factor authentication is super, super important. You don't necessarily need it on all of your accounts, but I would say for your email accounts, for your bank, for your Apple account, you know, for things that you use and have financial information attached to it, or that you could access that account to get financial information. Because if somebody gets access to your email, it's pretty much game over because they can go to all those various sites that you use, do password resets. It's going to come to that email address. Therefore, they can actually reset those passwords, which is why I do those backup email accounts. So I can kind of have a backdoor in if something like that does happen, but you definitely want to lock down with two factor, your email account as much as you can, your banks. I would also suggest Facebook, Twitter, you know, all those places where there's a lot more important information, just depending on what services you use to what level. But I would definitely suggest locking those accounts down. Again, if you have any questions on any of this, because it can be such a complex topic, it's really not that hard once you start. It's just doing those first couple of sites with like a, you know, an app like Authy. Once you do it, it's like, oh, this isn't too bad. And it's pretty easy just to kind of go through all your different sites and just take care of it. But you have to do it very methodically. I actually created a list of all the sites that I wanted to use logins and have that two-factor authentication used on and just went down the list site by site. As always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave a comment below or visit my site at adamontech.com and you can submit a form over there to ask any questions. I'm more than happy to help and maybe create future videos just like this one where I this video was strictly created because of questions I've received. Otherwise, this is Adam on Tech, signing off.